Então aí começa. Yes. Cool. I say that the recording has started. Uh, well, we're just over 60 people on the session. Um, cool. Uh, let's see, I was just trying to run something quickly here. Okay. Good. Uh, so I'll just uh, share my screen. Just let me know when you can see it. Okay. Uh, so hi everyone. So just a quick recap uh, from yesterday. Um, we were talking about Pandas, uh, Medbook Lead, and SKLEN. Uh, so we've, we've done uh, this uh, three first parts but we didn't, we were not able to get into modeling and uh, deployment. Uh, yeah, so that's what I want to talk about, mostly modeling. Uh, deployment, I'll, I'll say a few words, uh, but I don't think we'll have enough time uh, to get into it. Uh, so, but I'll say a few words about it. Cool. Uh, so if you still uh, have your copies of the notebook, um, you can, Try follow along as well. Uh, so, so what we did, we downloaded the data, uh, the Stanford uh, IMDB data. Uh, we did some pre-processing uh, pre uh, with pandas, uh, and then we looked at you know what the contents of that data um, are using uh, pandas, of course, uh, and then talked uh, briefly about Matplotlib, SKLearn. And then now we need to get into the modeling uh, using all those uh, tools that we discussed uh, up above. Um, so the problem here is we are trying to figure out what the sentiment is of movie reviews um, that are on the IMDB uh, website, right? And we're looking at two things. We're looking at negative reviews and positive reviews who are leaving out uh, all the neutrals, right? Cool. So, so there's there's um, two ways. Okay. So so here, what I've just done is just figure out, just check. Cause yeah, in the um, readme, they're saying that there's about twenty five thousand train uh, training reviews and there's about twenty five k test reviews. So with pandas, what you can do, because this uh, I've been loaded into a pandas data frame. What you can do is you can find out what the shape of that uh, data is, and we can see that indeed it's 25,000 uh, for each uh, data set, right? And there's two columns, which is, the one is the uh, review column. The, this, it's the, yeah, the actual text of the review, and the other uh, column is the labels. One for positive and zero for negative. Cool. Um, yeah, and then this is just some explanation of that. So if, to do, there's two ways we can go about uh, doing, uh, you know, sentiment analysis on the reviews. Uh, one way that uh, they have here is uh, what we call uh, just counting the frequencies of words uh, in there. So with machine learning models, uh, you can't uh, build with, because now our data is in textual form, but we need to convert it into numbers. Right, uh, so that the machine uh, learning model can actually, uh, you know, uh, you know, feed and predict on those numbers instead of so we're just changing the representation really uh, of of the words of or the text into into numerical uh, digits. Cool. Uh, so what we can do is we have two. We can do what's called n grams, right? So so each each review uh, is is called, is what they call a document. So we can actually represent uh, those documents as in D1, D2, and then that's, you know, the, the one review and then the second review. And then we convert it into a, like a vocabulary. So each word that exists in each document, uh, it will be part of, of the vocabulary. So only the unique words will be part of the vocabulary. As you can see, here, I am learning, machine learning is cool. We convert it into this vocabulary here. 
right? So as, as from the vocabulary, then we can say in, in document one, how many times does I okay? How many times that M okay? Uh, how many times that learning okay? And then we create uh, that, uh, I'd say, uh, frequencies of, of the words um, in the document, right? So that's a, it's a basic way of, 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 you know, changing the representation. Uh, unigrams and then there's biograms. So, and then there's trigrams. So, so depending on how many, uh, what the combinations of the words are. So for example, for biograms, you have, you know, two uh, words uh, together, right? So I, I, I am, I learning. So all the combinations of, of two words that you can find there, and then you count those occurrences, right? So for example, like really most times you, there's no I, I, so you know, usually be zero. Uh, but I am, you know, can probably occur uh, many, many times in, in a document. But in this case, it's, only, it's occurring once, uh, as we can see here, right? So that's one way of representing um, you know the textual data as a as a uh, either as a unigram or a bigram uh, using uh, so to implement that we'll use we will see uh, as we go we'll use something called a, a count vectorizer right uh, so the other way of actually doing it is what we call the because the problem with using just the frequencies is that um, so here, uh, well, we've been shown the step, but there are certain words, like for example, in the English uh, language, that don't add any uh, meaning uh, to 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 your to your document, right? So I am, you know, that like is there. So they call them, you know, stop words, right? So what you want to do is you want to reduce the impact of those stop words uh, in your prediction, right? Because really, they they, they don't add much to your, to your sentiment. Right, and then the words that occur less frequently uh, can be boosted in in, in how much uh, predictive power they actually have uh, in, in in that document. Okay, cool. So that's why they've invented this uh, thing called TFIDF, which is term frequency inverse document frequency. Right. So term frequency would be how many times does the particular term occur in that document, and then the inverse document frequency would be, you know, how many times does uh, the word okay in all the, doc the documents, similar to what we were doing here, but then now we take the inverse of it, as you can see here. Cool. And then they, you know, they do some transformation and put it in, in log scale. Uh, but that's just, uh, you know, some mathematics that they're doing here. But the, the core of it is here. And here it's just so they, they make sure that the mathematics uh, works out properly. Cool. Um, so I was explaining that, you know, for, for the count, just the count, we use uh, from scikit-learn, there's a, a module uh, called count vectorizer. And for the 10 frequency inverse document frequency, we use what it's called a TIF, T, TFIDF transformer. Cool. So, okay. So we've actually here, we've implemented uh, four different models just to see how they stack up against each other. So the unigram counts, uh, there's the bigram counts. They will be the uh, T I A T I T F I D F. Um, let me show you with unigram, and then there will be uh, T F I D F with bigrams, right? Uh, so I'll just explain one of the models, and then we'll, we'll rush through the others in terms of how we actually do the modeling. Uh, so here I've just commented out the actual. Uh, training uh, because I've done it before and because if if you, you keep running it every time it'll probably give you the, the same results but it may also take uh, a bit longer to to train because training takes longer than um, than testing so here oh, um, obviously so you remember in the imports we've actually imported this uh, current vectorizer uh, up here so you where it comes from so it actually comes here sorry Musa. yes uh, can I ask? Sorry to interrupt. Yeah, that's fine. Okay. Uh, I think maybe I'm. I, I didn't get. I didn't get the points that we are talking about. But I have only two questions. What are we doing with the text? And what exactly are we? Uh, are they using the usage of unigram and bigram? It's my first time to see it. That's why. Okay. Thank you. 
So, okay. So what's the use of the unigram and the bigram? And also, I think we were doing something on the text, like, uh, on the text yes. certificate. What exactly yes. are you doing on that part? Yeah, that is okay. So, uh, okay, so this is mostly uh, a continuation of uh, yesterday's lesson. Um, but what we said yesterday is that we have a sort of a corpus of data. And what we want to do is we want to figure out what uh, sentiment is contained in each review, right? So that's what the text, uh, textual data is, right? It's the reviews of different movies. Uh, I, I don't think, well, from the reviews, it doesn't say which movie it is, but it's just what the sentiment of that movie actually is, right? But for us to run machine learning models, we, we cannot feed it uh, textual data. You can't feed a machine learning model textual data. So you have to find a sort of an equivalent representation of that text. So that's why we're converting the text to uh, to digits, right? I'm not sure if that, that makes sense so far. Okay, okay. So so the, the way, so so you can you can represent it in multiple different forms. And here I was saying, when I was talking about the unigram and the bigram, that's just, you know, some of the representations that you can have, right? So uh, if, you, if you represent the, the text as unigrams, uh, you, you'll see as, as we go that um, the performance will be a certain way. If you have bigrams, it will be a, a certain way. And if it's a trigram, it will be a certain way, right? So, you, so yeah, uh, so depending on, on what uh, N you choose, you may have a better predict. Your model can perform better or worse, right? Uh, but but all in all, usually uh, the more uh, the larger your phrases, the better your performances, right? Uh, because you know we, you you have if you have a phrase, there, there's much more content there in terms of how you feel. And um, unlike when you have separate words, right? So the more uh, n you have. Uh, the better your predictive performance, as we'll see. But here we're only looking at one and two. Uh, we do have a tutorial uh, that you can play around with here at the bottom. Uh, I, I think it's not for submission, but you can play around with with it, where you can change, um, you know, your end, the size of your end, to see if the performance can improve. Okay. Okay. Right. Thank you. Thank you. Cool. Okay. So uh, where was I? Okay. So I was explaining. Uh, this part is commented out, uh, but you know, for yourself, because you don't have this files, you, you, you comment it out and then you run it, right? Um, this three steps. So basically with the count vectorizer, I was saying that it comes from SKLearn, right? It's, it's been implemented by SKLearn. I mean, it's something that, you, you know, when you understand how it works, as I was explaining, you can implement it yourself, but it really, you don't have to reinvent the wheel. And, you know, with SKLearn, the, the performance is better, right? It's usually going to be better than your own implementation. So uh, in future extraction, they've implemented these two things, right? Count vectorizer and TF-IDF uh, transform, which we are going to be using to see how they actually stack up against each other. Cool. Um, so this is the modeling part um, that we're doing. Um, okay, I've already explained that. Yeah, so, so what we're doing is we're just here, I'm just commenting out so it maybe can be clearer. So here what we're doing is we're saying, you know, we are uh, creating this object, this card vector as an object, and we're saying n-gram range as, you know, as a, an argument, and we're saying minimum number of, wor uh, of words, one, maximum is one. So this gives you a, a, a unigram, right? And then we're just storing that uh, object, and then we're using that object from that object, we are fitting, right? What we are fitting is this IMDB train uh, text of values. Uh, well, here it's a it's a data frame, but then we are only taking uh, one column, which is the text uh, column from there, and then we are getting the actual values. So, because here it will return. Uh, I didn't talk about it yesterday, but when you do this, it will actually return a different type of pandas object called a, a service. But we don't want a service. Uh, well, the, the way card vectorizer works is it doesn't take a service. It takes uh, a list of text. So when we, con we say dot values, it just creates a list of text. And then we fit it. Um, so basically what fitting does is just that 
it, it it's doing what I was explaining. It's creating those those unigrams and doing those those kinds of words, right? And then now what we do is we just save that um, you know that uh, those those uh, let's say uh, those weights that have been fitted right into this file here. That's why at the at the beginning I said let's um, if you remember here when we're making those directions and someone asked me why do we have to do it. Um, I think we did it at some point here up top, right? So when we're creating these directories, it's also that we can actually store uh, the models or the, the trained weights, right? So that's what we're doing now. So now we're using those directories that we've created, uh, which is which is here, yeah, right? So the data processors uh, directory contains this and we store it as a job lib uh, file, right? Uh, I do, I've put in an explanation in terms of, you know, why job lead. It's just a different way of, of storing your weights, all right? Um, so, okay, I'm, I'm not able to see some of the comments as I'm presenting because I'm in presenter mode, but I see there's a, uh, should we not remove the software? Yes, uh, your hands, we should. Uh, it, would, it would improve our performance. That's an optimization that you can add. We haven't done it here, but that's an optimization you should definitely add. So maybe when you do the tutorial, uh, see if you can remove the stop words and see if your performance improves. Okay, so so there's job lead uh, as opposed to pickle. So normally, uh, previously we used to st store machine learning um, models as pickles, uh, but here we're storing as as job lead because it performs faster for NumPy arrays. I've put an explanation here. I'll I'll update uh, this um, notebook and and reshare it. Cool. So now here, you know, we've done the training, then now we'll, we'll reload it because now we're, we're taking it from memory, we we'll reload it. Um, and then here, I was just wanted to show you what it's actually done, right? So what it's done is it's really, you know, like you were saying, stop words like there, you know, probably would be removed, two would be removed because they will impact how this um, algorithm performs, right? But this is what you get from from this object that was stored that was trained here, right? Cool. So this is all based on the training set. And you can see how you know how many uh, times each, each uh, word appears. Um, and now, you know, I'm, I'm just figuring out, okay, how many different words are actually in that vocabulary? And we can see that it's seven, uh, four, eight, four, nine, right? So basically uh, each word, uh, I might not have explained this, there's a, there's another file here, uh, which is just quickly, I'm gonna mention it quickly to say, because how do we know that, uh, for example, uh, love or hate is positive or negative sentiment? So they actually have a, just something, uh, ER. Okay, it's in, yeah. Okay. Uh, Okay, so it's this file, IMDBER. Uh, I think it, this is it's about sentiments. I forget what the actual um, uh, term is for the ER, okay? But it's just expected rating for each token, right? Uh, so it's already been computed. Most uh, natural language process, processing uh, libraries will use this, will use some vocabulary where uh, the sentiment is already pre-computed. So basically what those, um, you know, um, algorithms from SKLearn will use will be based on whatever, I, I'm not sure if it's, uh, you know, psychologists or sociologists who have already pre-computed that to say, this is how much sentiment is, is contained in this, um, in this word. Anyway, so let's move faster. Um, anyway, so, so that's what this is. Uh, so, so what, yeah, what you can do, Okay, you can figure out, you know, are there any nulls or so this is a perfect data set. You know, there's not much, uh, you know, uh, pre-processing that you have to do, right? There's every, there's every review and every review has been labeled. Uh, and then here you can see uh, sort of a representation of that here, um, which words uh, are at the top and which words are at the bottom in terms of occurrences. Right? So you see there's even numbers, etc. These are some of the things that you may want to remove, but you see, not everything is in English, 
So may, you may want to like only focus on the English or, or not. So it's really up to you. Um, but yeah, so once we've done that, uh, so so we load, uh, you know, whatever uh, we've already trained. Um, and then so, so there's two steps, this fit and this transform, but I was saying that you can actually do it in one step, right? Uh, here. So here we've done, uh, we've done a fit and then at, somewhere at the bottom we do a transform, but you can do it all at once because that's what returns um, the actual weights, right? Uh, cool. So now what is this the transform, but you can actually uh, do it in, in one uh, to get that, those weights of, of, of your model. Anyway, um, so let, yeah, so this is, so that, that was for the Unigram uh, for count vectorizer. Now we have the Unigram with uh, TFIDF, and then we've also done Bigram, same process, and then we've done uh, Bigram, uh, TFIDF, right? Anyway, it's the, the process is the same. Um, yeah, and then what we do now, what we wanna do is actually now run uh, the predictions, right? So we run the predictions and what we're seeing here is that, you know, as, as I was saying before, so Unigram, we're getting, uh, if, so validation score is better in terms of the performance of our model than the train score. So here we're getting 87% accuracy uh, for the TFIDF. It's, it's better because you see we've done the inverses. So we've downweighted the words that occur the most. So it's a better performance, background counts, you know, same as TFIDF, Unigram, but Bigram, TFIDF will get 90%, right? So maybe one thing to note quickly uh, is that, uh, just see if I can see quickly as part of the bigrams, is that bigrams in this case, what they do is they include both unigrams and bigrams. So it's actually incremental. So even though it's bigrams, but you still have unigrams there. Anyway, that's the, that's the performance we're getting uh, for the bigram uh, TFIDF, which you know is better than than the rest, uh, yeah. So there's a tutorial here, so I'm just gonna wrap up so that uh, JP and Desmond uh, can continue the lesson. I've already taken too much of their time, uh, so there's a tutorial here that you can play around with uh, with the data set um, that was was given, I think, on Monday. Uh, it's sort of similar to the process that I was explaining here, but you're just doing it on a different data set. Um, yeah, so I want to explain this, uh, you know, you can do automated uh, parameter search when you're fitting, but uh, at this point, you wouldn't have time to go through it. Uh, but yeah, maybe uh, to explain that, you know, the model that we're using to actually get the prediction here is the SGD classifier, right? Remember this regression classification. So we're just chosen this, this one for just uh, as, a, as a starter uh, model. And it does have all, all the parameters, but you can do random search of the, the parameters. Um, cool. Uh, I'm not sure if there's any questions on that, but I think if they, they are, you can uh, put uh, put them in in Slack or in in, in Google Meet, and then I'll answer them. Uh, yeah. And then the, the last thing that you know we probably won't, we don't have time to talk about now is you know how do you then deploy this model? So there's two ways. Uh, I mean, you can deploy with any. Uh, web framework, uh, but you know you can deploy with Flask, which, which is easier and and Streamlit, which is much much easier, right? But what that deployment does is you just create, um, you know, so for example, you get a new review, and what you want to know is how good is this review, right? So that's you, so you do a, I think we did a score here. Uh, yeah, so you just you know you do a score based on 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 the the new data that you, on the new review that you have and then yeah and then you get your your prediction uh yeah so i think i'll, I'll stop right there um sorry for taking so much uh, time uh, jb uh, i think yeah i'll take the questions on uh, on 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 chat or on slack thank you Okay, um, thank yeah. you, Misha. I'll, yeah, I'll stop sharing now. Sir. Just a moment.
Okay, so I hope uh, I hope you guys can see my screen. Uh, today I'll be talking about uh, ML systems and pipelines. Um, so yesterday we talked about workflow uh, for data science, and uh, basically uh, pipelines are also like a bigger picture of workflows, uh, like a set of workflows. So without further ado, uh, let's dig in. Um, so. As a data engineer, uh, like other engineers, uh, this concept of systems thinking is very important. You are always dealing with uh, many components uh, with your system, within your system. And so you, and, and to understand your system, you can't look at just one component. You have to understand it as a whole. And uh, what system, systems thinking is, is basically uh, analyzing your system by fo by uh, focusing on the way uh, that the components of the system uh, interrelate uh, the relationships between the components of the system and how they affect uh, each other and the system as a whole. Because the components of the system um, are affecting each other and the effect on each other uh, defines the behavior of the whole system. So this picture here is basically uh, trying to indicate the components of the system. We see ourselves as engineers also as components of the system because we have some effect on the system. The way we uh, approach the system defines how the system is going to look. And then uh, you also have uh, uh, subsystems. Uh, these are like uh, a set of components in the system. And each of these components here in this picture, uh, what this is showing is that they affect each other and uh, to, to have a holistic understanding of the uh, system, you should consider each of the components. So um, the, there is uh, systems thinking and then there is uh, traditional thinking. Uh, we just saw that systems thinking involves understanding the relationships between components uh, of, uh, of the system. So uh, you may have component A affecting component B and C and then component C also affecting A uh, so these uh, arrows uh, are showing just that the, the nature of uh, systems thinking and uh, complex systems, their um, relationships uh, between these components, and uh, it's not linear. Uh, but when you look at traditional thinking, you think of a component and then you think how that component affects uh, the next component, and then you think how that next component affects another component. So basically, you're going in a linear fashion. You're not trying to understand the mutual uh, interconnection, mutual relationships between the components. So uh, like I said, uh, as an engineer, the systems thinking is the most uh, useful way to approach your systems. Uh, because if you think in the linear fashion, in the traditional sense, uh, you're going to miss something. Uh, yesterday, uh, we went through the workflow, the data science workflow. We saw that uh, the crisp DM workflow is not linear. Uh, you can go to, for instance, data understanding and then choose to go back to business understanding. Uh, so basically business understanding is affecting uh, uh, data understanding, but also data understanding affects uh, business understanding. So that's an example of a systems thinking approach. Um, next, uh, you have many components, uh, many stages in when you are doing a systems development, when you are developing a data science system uh, or a machine learning system. And so you start from the uh, idea. And this here, this uh, diagram here is, uh, is showing the cyclic uh, linear uh, nature of this software development life cycle. But this is a traditional way to develop software. Uh, in most cases, you're not going to be using this traditional way. You're going to have to uh, have an initial idea and then do some feasibility study, uh, technical feasibility and business viability, and then look at the requirements. But then you may need to go back uh, some, uh, some stage uh, before or jump somewhere uh, in the future. So, um, now, we have uh, many concepts which are very important for a data engineer uh, to be able to analyze systems. So um, you have tasks in the system. So when you're, uh, uh, when you're applying a project, when you're planning a project, uh, 
Uh, you have uh, different, uh, you, you, you decompose the project into different tasks, and then uh, tasks of tasks, so subtasks. So this is uh, what tasks refers to. And then you also have a process, which is like the bigger picture of tasks. So it's like a set of tasks that uh, are chained in a simple, uh, usually simple, doesn't have to meet with you, uh, or complex ways. So you may have to do task A, and then uh, do task B, and then the results of task B are going to be uh, 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 useful for task A. So that's why you don't do each task at once. Uh, I mean, uh, you don't do task A and then go to task B to task uh, uh, C. So you may, uh, uh, most of the time, there's going to be the uh, uh, component of uh, the, the idea of uh, doing them in parallel. Uh, so instead of doing one and then finishing it and moving to the next, uh, you do all of them at once. So um, and then uh, workflow. Uh, yesterday we looked at what, what a workflow is. Uh, in particular, we looked at uh, Crisp DM, and what this is is basically a set of stages. Uh, uh, and stages are basically a set of each stage is a set of task uh, of tasks. Each stage gives you the what kinds of tasks you have to do. So here, workflow is the relationship between those stages or sets of processes uh, to improve efficiency. And so you can also uh, do different uh, stages or processes in parallel instead of doing one and then another and then another in the in linear fashion. So um, basically, the workflow is like a formula. Uh, it's all about efficiency and optimization. Uh, and then uh, there is uh, the concept of a pipeline. Uh, a pipeline is uh, nothing else than a workflow after another workflow. It's like a set of workflows, basically. So you could have uh, a data science workflow, uh, for instance, crisp DM, and then have uh, a machine learning workflow or a deep learning workflow, and then you can connect them end to end or do them in parallel as well. So as you can see, uh, these processes, workflow, pipeline, uh, they all uh, are not limited to being done in the linear fashion. You can choose to do them that way, although you might miss out on some things like one stage informing the other, or you may choose to do uh, them in the parallel fashion. <coughs> each, each of these approaches has its own advantages and uh, disadvantages. So then, uh, okay, let's look at again at uh, workflow. Uh, I just said that workflow is, is all about efficiency and optimization. Basically, you're trying to uh, uh, make your process, your software development or machine learning or uh, data science development uh, as, as efficient as possible. And uh, uh, so here uh, you organize your tasks or stages of the workflow to, to optimize uh, uh, efficiency. Here, of course, there's automation, and then there's uh, uh, you know something that is that, that's attractive uh, to handle, manage, and then um, uh, so somebody should mute themselves. Okay. Um, Um, JB, if I think someone has muted you, you can just unmute. JB, if you are still presenting, I I don't think everybody else is hearing you. I certainly am not hearing you. Um, sorry, sorry, guys. Um, I just noticed that my microphone was off. Uh, so, um, yeah, this is uh, this was uh, unfortunate. Okay, so I'll go quickly through the uh, slides before I think we still have some time. So, what I was saying basically is that uh, systems thinking is a way of looking at your systems, uh, machine learning systems, data science systems, software uh, systems as a set of components I'm which sorry. have relationships. Yes? 
JB, uh, you are around slide uh, six. I don't think you need to. Yeah, go but I just noticed that. I just noticed that uh, my mic was off. So I was just trying to go through and give a very, very brief summary of each, each slide. Yeah. Okay. If, JB, if, that's if anyone. We heard you. Yeah, present, anyone, uh, uh, all this. Sorry, That's what I'm saying. Say... We heard you. We, okay. we, were, we, were, we heard you uh, present all the way to uh, slide six on the current slide. We heard what. Okay. You yeah. Let me let me then continue from here. Okay. Yeah. So yeah. Uh, I was saying that workflow is all about uh, optimization and efficiency. And if you look at all these, uh, these are the goals of uh, a workflow. A good workflow should help uh, achieve these. Uh, objectives, uh, automation, management, uh, you should have your uh, your tasks uh, tractable, uh, easy to handle, and, and uh, uh, a workflow should be something that you can apply to another project, not something that's rigid uh, and only applicable to one single project. And then uh, there's the resources part, uh, you're trying to optimize your resources use, whether it's money, uh, time, or uh, human resources. And then uh, it should be agile. Uh, here it should be um, easy to adapt. Uh, if you make a mistake, you should be able to correct it without uh, changing other components or other processes in the workflow. And then scaling as well. Uh, it shouldn't be only applicable to a certain size of projects. It should be applicable to all sizes of projects, uh, especially when you're moving from a small project to uh, a medium or large uh, size project. Uh, communication, uh, as uh, any data engineer uh, or uh, engineers really, uh, most technical people uh, have the issue of uh, communication. Uh, like, uh, but it's very important uh, uh, for uh, people working in the same workflow to be communicating so that everyone is on the same page about the project. And um, there is, of course, the time. Uh, so this is about time efficiency, uh, optimizing time. So this, um, uh, this is like uh, the summary of uh, the software development lifecycle, SDLS, SDLC. Uh, here is basically trying to uh, bring your uh, practices in, uh, in business to building software. Uh, so uh, again, maybe there should be errors, um, uh, planning, design, and implement, uh, test, deploy, maintain. Uh, uh, but uh, the errors are not really, they, they shouldn't be uh, linear. Uh, uh, if you are trying to approach your uh, projects from the systems thinking approach. And then um, next we have uh, managing your project, your data science uh, pipeline and controlling it. So you have uh, in the software development life cycle, you have phases, uh, the one in this uh, we just saw. So uh, you have to plan for the project. Uh, again, uh, learn about the technical feasibility and uh, business viability of the project requirements and then do some uh, uh, design and analysis. Uh, okay, here uh, there's uh, building the, uh, the process type, implementing and uh, uh, maintaining and sustainability. And each of these uh, phases uh, has goals, it has objectives. So there's this control layer to make sure that uh, the goals are met. Uh, and here, uh, there are um, like some groups uh, of these uh, SDLC phases, uh, the planning and organization, uh, these three, the first three. But as you can see, you also see that they overlap each other. So this again uh, hints at the nonlinear uh, nature of uh, software development. Uh, whether it's for machine learning or traditional software development. And then uh, there is, uh, we just saw structured uh, part of development, uh, the dev, and then there is ops. Uh, so, and then the combination of these two, the structured development uh, gives DevOps. And really DevOps uh, originated from the traditional software engineering, but it's uh, it's being apl applied. The principles are being applied to machine learning projects and data science projects, and so um, 
operations team, our infrastructure uh, uh, process owners for the organization. Uh, of course, uh, they're managing the uh, life cycle. Uh, and then, uh, so here, uh, uh, the, 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 the responsibility of uh, this uh, structured development and structured operations, are, uh, again, we saw that uh, uh, workflow was a big part of uh, structured development and it's all about uh, optimization. So if you look at here, you will see a mix of those. Uh, there's self-service for teams. Uh, so teams are basically more or less self-governing and then standardizing uh, uh, tools and processes across the business so that everybody is on the same page. Uh, you can't have one team using different principles and another team using other principles. And then automation and uh, uh, working and shipping with developers. So uh, most of the time when they say DevOps, uh, we, uh, we think of deployment and uh, maintenance and, uh, uh, and uh, sustainability, but really they also have to um, uh, work on those and uh, in increase, optimize their uh, processes and also uh, ship just as developers do that. So here we see have uh, uh, more of uh, DevOps and uh, the benefits, as you can see, shortens uh, development cycle, so the optimization part and then the speed. Uh, so basically they're the same thing. There's development and then deployment. Um, dependable production releases. Uh, and uh, these uh, aspects are made possible by these two uh, concepts, uh, continuous integration, uh, where you have uh, uh, different uh, versions uh, being worked on and then uh, trying to uh, basically ship uh, every day. Uh, uh, you may have one version diverging from others. Uh, so every software engineer is working not on the same version. And that helps with uh, finding, uh, building faster. And then continuous delivery here is basically releasing, doing multiple releases as uh, frequently as possible. So uh, that was uh, the pipeline uh, aspect and uh, machine learning or data science uh, systems aspects um, of data science and uh, of, uh, of the work of the data engineer. Uh, so I'll let uh, uh, Desmond come in and talk about uh, these other aspects, MLOps and AutoML. Um, well, thank you so much. I think maybe I can present my screen. Are you able to see my screen and just get a confirmation? Yeah. So thank you. So um, um, in this other part of the tutorial, we are uh, to learn about uh, machine learning systems and um, the machine learning operations and uh, MLOps and auto, auto Auto ML, that is the um, automatic machine learning. So, um, with creation of um, um, machine learning ops, as we have seen, we also have something that is called DevOps. Uh, ML ops just stands for uh, machine learning operations. So, um, just as uh, the development of um, uh, the DevOps is, uh, we also have. Um, uh, ML ops, where we are trying to create uh, models, and in these models, uh, with um, um, data engineering, as we can see, and machine learning engineering, we can have a system where we um, have um, continuous or uh, uh, our models are able to be um, to to uh, continuously be integrated. Uh, and we can be able to um, learn, we can be able to develop them in a continuous manner. So um, in machine learning, we have, um, uh, as you can see in this presentation, we have uh, data engineering, 
which just involves um, getting uh, the right data. And then after that, we curate the data. Um, and then we go to the machine learning or the ML engineering. Um, after being able to create um, machine learning algorithms, which are able to make, um, to learn uh, our system, then we can deploy the, the models that we have created. And these models, we can be able to create um, applications from them. So um, with the indications that we'll get, the key performance index of those models, we can be able to improve uh, our systems by machine learning. So you can see that we have got um, a, a kind of a system that flows all the way from data engineering to curating the data and uh, um, after curating the data, we can go ahead to have the machine learning engineering. Um, if our data is um, not the one that we want, we can go back to the data engineering step um, and get the correct data. And then again, it gets back to uh, machine learning. So when we are at the process of creating machine learning, we um, the machine learning engineering, we create models. And in these models, you can be able to deploy them and get uh, um, applications um, that can work. So we can see that it's, it forms a complete kind of a circuit um, that is we are able to loop through. Um, so machine learning operations, uh, just as uh, also um, DevOps, it applies similar principles. Uh, similar principles are applied in, in machine learning systems. And we can be able to see from um, um, this chart that is just over here that we have ML development, we have the training operations, um, the center of it being data and uh, model management. Uh, we have uh, the continuous training, the model deployment, we have predictive, um, we have um, predicting, prediction serving, and then we have uh, the continuous monitoring. So we will take a look at uh, each of these um, uh, steps that are presented here so that we can better understand them. So um, the components that um, are there in the MLOps um, are um, these kinds of components where we have the configuration, and we also have um, the automations. Um, just as we saw that um, in, in the data engineering part, we have collection of the data and the verification. You verify the data that this is the correct data that uh, we actually want. So uh, as we saw in, in this kind of system, that in this part is uh, when we are doing the ML engineering, we are able to um, understand the type of data that you want. And if it is not the right data that you want, especially for that uh, machine learning um, that you are dealing with, then we, um, if it is not the one that you want, then we get back to the data engineering again. But if it is the one that we want in this part, then we can be able to proceed to have um, the deployment of, of, of the model that we have created through machine learning engineering. So that is um, the part of verification of the data. So after you have um, uh, you have done your data collection and you have verified your data, you also do a feature extraction. A feature extraction is where you are able to um, get the the features in that data that the data set that you are presented with, the features that you are going to use in creation of uh, of the model. Um, then we have um, the machine learning code after you have been able to um, extract or you have done your feature engineering, you, um, you can create, you can be able to code and create a model that will be able to, um, we, you will be able to use in um, the setup of uh, the engineering or the machine learning that you're using. So after that, you uh, also, you will do your testing and uh, debugging of the model that you have come up with. Um, 
we have um, also model analysis. You analyze the kind of um, the kind of model that you um, you already have, so that you can be able to see that um, is that the right model that you are to use in that kind of machine learning um, aspect that you are uh, doing. So we also have the process management, the metadata management, um, the resource management, um, um, serving the infrastructure that you have come up with, and then you monitor that kind of model that you um, that you have um, been able to uh, to code or to to develop. Um, so the workflow of um, the MLOps is um, as as presented. So we have uh, uh, the machine learning development. Um, we have the code and we have the configuration, um, and then we have the training operations. So um, you understand very well that in um, um, every machine learning that um, or almost all the data science uh, projects that maybe you do we. Uh, the data that you're presented with, um, you divide the data into the training set and then um, and then the one that you will also use for, for the testing. So um, in this part, after coming up with the model, we be able to train that model um, so that we can see um, how the model operates. Um, after training um, the model, um, so the training pipeline goes now to um, the continuous training um, that is now a further and further training of, of the model that you have been able to to create or come up with. So um, at this point, you can be able to see we can have a branch of um, the data and uh, the model management. So you'll be able to um, manage that model that you have come up with. Um, from From the continuous training, now we can be able to uh, proceed to um, to deploy our model. So um, after you have ensured that now your model as um, you have trained and you're able to also score uh, that the model is working well, you can be able to now deploy your your model. Um, so after deploying your your model, you uh, proceed to um, to predict the prediction serving. So you be able to now uh, predict the outcome of um, uh, the kind of system that you are able to, um, to to come up with. So after predicting, we now get to the continuous monitoring. You now you you are able to monitor um, how your your model works, uh, and then from from monitoring we can go. Uh, we see we have another branch that takes us back to. Um, the data and the modeling, we, now we are able to, to see um, the kind of data that we serve to our model. And if it, uh, by continuous monitoring, you are able to see that is it giving the correct output of, of um, the model that you want. So with, with, the, with, the, with serving it with different types of data, if you realize that um, your model is now not giving um, the correct predictions or it is not working in the manner that you expect, you can be able to go ahead and get back to the first step where we were talking about um, the developing, the development of, um, of, of the machine, of the machine learning. So um, um, from there, we can also be able to see the, uh, the capabilities of, um, of the MLOps of MLOps. The fundamental capabilities of MLOps is that uh, um, it has to be reliable, scalable, and secure. So those are um, um, the capabilities that um, the MLOps has um, compared to the traditional systems of, uh, of coming up with, with models. So in MLOps, we are able to ensure that um, the kind of model that we come up with is is a reliable one um, in that it is we are able to rely on the kind of the predictions that it will give us because we can see that if by continuously monitoring our model we can uh, be able to know um, 
if it is giving us the correct output and if it is not giving us the correct output we can be able to go back to do another uh, machine learning model or to improve our model so that it can give us the uh, it can be reliable we can also be able to scale um, uh, to, to scale our model in that uh, it, it can be able or capable to uh, to expand or to bring it to a bigger scale uh, or um, if in case you can also be able to make it smaller um, and then it is also security and privacy is an important factor um, uh, an, imp an important capability that MLOps um, has so um, so machine learning development process um, as we have seen from the very first evening DevOps we have getting of our data um, getting of our data and uh, we are able to curate that data and make it available for the machine learning um, that um, machine learning engineering that we are, we are able to to come up with so in in um, uh, the process that is here is we get the data um, curate the data and then this data is uh, we we are able to use that data so that we come up with a machine learning um, algorithm. Then from that algorithm, we can be able to serve it into um, our servers, make the configurations and the codes, and then we are able to train um, uh, the model that we, we, we come up with. We are able to train it. Um, we come up with a, a formula for the training, and then um, we are also able to um, to train also the operation of of, um, of that machine learning model. So in this part of coming up with a model, we can see that um, we can have a, um, a back and forth, especially in getting the, the right type of data that we use in in our in in the model that we want to create. So um, creation of uh, of models, it is important that we uh, we use or we are able to use the correct data that will give us also the correct um, prediction. So in this part also is um, the part where we are also able to come up with um, the features that we need in, in that data set, um, especially uh, when doing the, the, feature, um, the feature extraction or feature engineering. Um, training of um, of the operations, um, so the, 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 when when you are um, when you have also been able to come up with a model, uh, it is important that you serve it enough data that is able to train um, that data. Um, enough data that 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 is able to make the correct training so that our our model is is able to um, to have um, the correct um, type of um, uh, the correct training, especially uh, data that is used for training should be more, um, as we understand that training of, um, of the data, especially when you're, you'll be able to score that, how much is, uh, how much score can we give to our, our data set or our model, that is. Um, so after training of, um, of, our, of our model, we be able to get to the process of now deploying our model. Um, you register model, build that model, you test the model, and then you deploy it to um, uh, using the different um, servers that you can use in, 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 in deploying um, a model. Um, I'm just trying to rush because time is far past. So uh, after we have been able to deploy our model, we can also be able to monitor the engine or monitor how how much our model is able to to score especially in giving the correct predictions of um, if it is um, a certain type of uh, model that we are using especially to make a prediction how much is it able to score um, the accuracy of our model so when monitoring our model um, we 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 ensure that um, the data set that is given is, um, is maximum, especially in the training. And then we also be able to just ensure that 
um, the, the model is, is, um, is working correctly and it is giving the right outputs. So um, with the outputs that it, it gives, we are able to monitor if the model is working correctly or um, there is a change that we need to make in, in the model. Um, finally, we have the end-to-end, -end, MLOps end-to-end. Um, uh, from what we have seen throughout um, the class is that uh, the tutorial today is that we have the training um, opera, opera operations. Uh, so it concerns uh, the automating the automating the processes of packaging, testing, and deploying repeatable and reliable training uh, pipelines. So in training, we are able to uh, come up with uh, or to see um, uh, that we serve correct uh, correct uh, data to our model. And then we have continuous training whereby we, uh, the concerns repeatedly executed, executing the training pipeline um, in response to new data so that, um, or to code, uh, to code the changes or uh, on schedule potential, potentially with the new training setting. So we can be able to feed also different um, data to our model and see that um, how much is it able to, to learn from the model, from the data that we are, are feeding it. And by that, it is able to continuously train. And then we have the model deployment that concerns uh, packaging, testing, and deploying of a model in uh, serving environments for online experimentation, experimentations and also production, um, production serving. Then we have uh, prediction serving. Um, is about serving the model that is deployed in production for inference. Is it being able to predict the correct output that we want? And then we have the continuous monitoring. It's about monitoring the effectiveness and the efficiency of the model that we are able to deploy. Um, the effectiveness and also the efficiency. Uh, how much is it efficient for us to have that kind of model? And how much is its effectiveness in terms of our, the kind of um, uh, the learning out, uh, outcome that we expect. Um, also, we have the data and the model management that governs um, machine learning artifacts to support uh, shareability, reusability, discoverability, um, auditability, traceability, and compliance to uh, machine learning assets. So the assets of, uh, of machine learning uh, that we, we, we have to be keen to check on is, um, can we be able to share it? Is it reusable? Can it be discovered? Um, can it be edited? Can we be able to trace it? Can we be, uh, is it compliant to um, the machine learning assets? So um, with that, that um, marks or brings us to the end. Um, if we have questions, we can be able to raise the questions. Um, also in the afternoon, I think we'll be, we'll be able to have a session to, uh, session to just um, answer some of the questions. In, in, in this tutorial that we've covered today. I can see, did you have a question? Yeah, I do. Uh, I think I missed the part uh, where you explained, uh, JB explained about CI and CD and also DevOps. Maybe if you could, if you could uh, give me a quick summary of it, continuous integration and continuous delivery. And also the second, if I'm not sure if you talked about what is referred to as auto email, maybe you can also tell me about that. Thank you. Okay, maybe again, what was your last question? Auto email. Yeah, I don't, I don't, maybe you can talk about what is it. Like, is that the that process you where talk this ML ops end to end? Maybe what is referred to as auto ML or something. Okay, okay. So, so we have seen um, ML, op, M, ML ops and um, how it um, it um, the processes that the end to end that is from um, getting the data. Um, 
curating the data, ensuring that this is the correct data that we need for our, um, our machine learning, and then creating of the model, getting ahead to train that model. Um, after training the model, we um, are able to, to, um, to deploy um, that model to test it, and then also we can be able to monitor the model at the end. So um, AutoML is like trying to create um, um, one that does automatically all those uh, procedures or steps that we have been able to 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 look to look at. Um, maybe I don't know if JB can handle on the part of um, CIA CD continuous integration and continuous development. JB, if you are in. Okay, we can pick um, Fiseha's question in the meantime. Oh, uh, sorry, I thought I put it down. Uh, I was just going to ask you if this slide was going to be available, but I already found it on Google Drive. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. So, JB? Uh, um, sorry, Desmond, I was fixing my uh, my microphone. What was, uh, what was the question? Um, he asked if you could be able to elaborate more on um, CICD. Yeah, continuous so and continuous yeah. development. Yeah, uh, CI is basically uh, you have uh, multiple versions of a software. I think of uh, any software application, for instance, or let's say a machine learning application or data science uh, pipeline. And uh, most most of the time, you imagine one version, right? One version running. But you could have uh, many versions, uh, and then everyone is working on different versions, and uh, and so the version which is better gets deployed, uh, and uh, you, you combine them, and then um, that's that's what uh, integration is. Now, usually this is done daily on a daily basis. Uh, so the key idea is you have multiple uh, versions, uh, multiple software systems uh, being worked on by different developers. And, uh, and then you also have for continuous delivery, this has to do more with DevOps, with uh, deploying and, uh, and shipping. Uh, and this is uh, uh, trying to do multiple releases. Uh, instead of producing one version and then you wait for a month or uh, one time uh, to, to produce another version, you can uh, add uh, also increments and then uh, uh, ship as frequently as possible. That's what continuous delivery is. Okay. Mm. I can see Chikoni, you raised your hand. Okay. So um I can't see any further hand reason. So I think we can stop there and then the sorry, that was, that was, that, that's what that was, that was been a mistake from my side, sorry. About it. The okay, hundreds, okay. but thanks so much for the for the presentation. That was nice. Okay. So um I think we um I think we can stop at that point and then we um continue in the next tutorial.